Okay, who's ready to pop out the crystal ball for 2024? Well, not me, because I really don't like making those kinds of predictions. I don't mind putting my opinion out there for the world to hear. It is here on the internet, so you can go back and watch other videos and see if I was right or wrong. But why do that if we have this one to talk about today? And the way that I want to go about this is I want to look back at a comment that just can't get out of my head because, well, as I was reviewing my channel over the last year, it popped up and I thought, why don't we go ahead and make a rebuttal, a response, uh, I, I don't know what you want to call it to this comment. I did respond to the comment as I do to every single comment that I get, positive, negative, or otherwise, because I like the criticism, I like the conversation, and I would love to have the debate, because if I can learn, I'm cool with that. Like I've said, I like to give my opinion on what I think is going to happen. I'll give it to you right now. I don't think the market's going to crash based on the overwhelming number of predictors that are out there right now. And by predictors, I mean data. I only make my opinion based off data the same way that I tell my clients. If I'm showing you a house, if I'm helping you sell your house, I want to make sure that you have the data, bam, right there in front of you so that you can make an informed decision. Everything that I say on this channel is my informed decision or my informed opinion broadcast to the world. So let's jump right in to this comment that had me kind of figuring, was I right? Was I wrong? This is a great place to be and always looking back and seeing if you can improve. So let's start with this. He starts with, are you serious? Well, usually I'm trying to get better at this to provide something of value. He says this exactly, or this is exactly what every noob it, that must be me. I'm the noob here, right? Has repeated 20 times a day since 2007 and 1988 with much smaller bubbles. Well, I agree that 1988 might have been a smaller bubble than 2007. What I disagree with here is that we had a bubble this last year. See, this comment was four months ago in August. I think it was in August. By the way, yeah, because this was my August 23 update. The update was, are listing prices going up? Lo and behold, they were. He moves on to say that less than 9% of the population can afford the average uh, can afford the average house now and investors can get 5% ROI on no risk bonds. Well, I will agree. There was bonds at 5%. That makes sense. And less than 9% of the population Yeah, I don't know that that's exactly the case. There's a lot of data out there that you can put together to show that things can be more affordable based on current incomes. Yes, interest rates suck. Yes, prices suck. But people are still buying homes. And there are really two subsets of the population that are out there screaming at the world. You have one side saying, the crash is coming, everybody cover your heads and be ready. And you have the other side saying, I don't want to crash. That would be ridiculous. And there are only two sides to this equation. The people that are renting want to crash, typically. The people that own don't want to crash. There's nobody in their right mind that own any type of asset. I'm not saying houses or otherwise, just asset that is sitting back going, God, I hope the value goes down. That would be amazing. If you're out there and that's what you're thinking, drop a comment down below. Tell me why. I would love to know. Other than for tax purposes, you know, maybe you have an end of the year goal or whatever the case may be, or what? What would make you want assets to fall? Those renters or those 35%, they want it to fall so they can buy. I get that. I want everything to be cheaper that I want to buy too, but it doesn't make it real. So moving through, expecting this to be sustainable or worsen is idiocy. Yeah, I'm, I'm the idiot here, right? All I was putting in this video was information based off of current market data. I'm never putting anything in a video I can't back up. Doop doop. If incomes suddenly double, it will mean the Fed has given up fighting inflation and the U.S. economy will crash because nobody will buy U.S. products. Well, the Fed hasn't given up fighting inflation. In fact, they've changed their course because inflation did come down. I'm going to say the reality of inflation is it's still remarkably high. But based off the PCE and the core data that they are using, 
inflation came down. So they've already reversed course. Coming into the new year, they have already speculated and said, including on the dot plot graphs, that interest rates will come down. Some expect up to six interest rate drops this coming year. What might that do to home prices? Think about that for a second. If interest comes down, are home prices going to crash? Are we going to see the fall? Is it going to fall out the bottom? Either they will flush the USD, the dollar, down the toilet, or get the housing market reset that Jerome Powell called for using those exact words. Well, I agree that Powell said that. I think that there are differing opinions on what a reset exactly is. He wanted to reset the trajectory, not blow it up entirely. Moving forward, please remove this idiocy. It is destroying the lives of young and financially illiterate people. I believe there are a lot of lives being destroyed out there. Young, old, everybody in between. I'm not ageist. Lives get destroyed daily. However, Financially illiterate people should be turning to information like this to become literate. Nothing I have said should push somebody to make a decision. It might encourage them to learn the information and then make a decision though. So let's jump into that data. I love talking about the data because it's not me making the decision. This data comes from the Cromford Report here in Phoenix. We're one of the very, in fact, I believe we're the only market that gets this data. And what they do is they take all of the information from our MLS, from our county recorders, and they put that into a way that we can digest it, use it, and understand it. So we're going to back right up to the idea of nobody was buying homes because they could all buy 5% return on investment bonds. Was that true? I say no. And here's why. See, when we look at the data for 2023, you can see that right here, 75% in the first quarter of purchases were owner occupied. Down below, another 10% second home. Down below that, 13.7% investor. Now, mind you, this is in the first quarter. This comment was in August. So we're already moved to the end of the third quarter. Moving throughout the year, you can see this data doesn't fall off a cliff. In fact, if you go all the way to the bottom, you can see there was even an increase in iBuyer purchases, which were very high earlier in the season of investing back here and got much lower because, for example, there was not the rate of return that they wanted and prices had to turn the other direction. We'll get to that in a moment. But there were still investors there were still home purchasers here. You have, on average, what you should see is in that 75% purchasing as an owner-occupied home. This would be considered normal, historically speaking, if you were to average it out. Then on top of that, in this Phoenix marketplace, we have a large second home population. So those are also owners that are buying them as a second home. Nobody backed out of the market. It didn't change significantly. When you look over at 30-year fixed mortgages, you can see right here at the peak where we were jumping into the 8% range. Yeah, that totally sucked. And that was really, really hard on our market. That slowed everything down. But that was just the, the end of that cycle. You can see from there moving down, interest rates have improved. The interest rates moving up all through 2023, in fact, up from way over here in 21, this is what's caused all the fear and all the speculation that the market was just going to fall out from underneath itself to crash, so to speak. Again, it hasn't done that. There have been corrections, there have been changes, and it's different all over the country. I'm not speaking broadly to any other market. We're only talking about the Phoenix market here, which, if you're watching this, is probably the one you're interested in. So what I want to do is I want to cover some of the basic information on any housing market. These are the things that you should be looking at to understand where and when and how, what a market is doing. And to start, we're gonna look at new listings. See, new listings are a sign of what sellers are thinking. If sellers don't wanna sell their home, well, that's going to mean a couple of things for buyers. Less inventory means more competition, assuming the same number of buyers are out there. 
So when we're looking at new listings, we're gonna look back at 2023 and we're gonna see that this line here is quite low. Now without perspective, that doesn't mean anything. So let's go ahead and add the last two decades to this graph and you'll see a different story. And what we see is we have the fewest listings in 2023 that have hit the market in the last two plus decades. That's not a great sign for the market moving forward, right? especially for buyers. Fewer homes to choose from with the same amount of demand means one thing, competition. Competition means prices tend to go up. Not always, but tend to. Let's look to see if that's the case. We're gonna continue on with new listings feed into a pool of active listings. Active listings in 2023 are the pink line here, and you can see they follow off of 2022, where we had a lot of listings on the market, not enough to satisfy demand, but a lot, and it fell off all year long. Right around here, if you remember, was when we were peaking at that 8% range here in October, or just before. We had just eclipsed 7% in the middle of the year, right there in June. We were running at 7%. That's not really good for buyer's motivation, which is what we started to see here. Buyer motivation dropping off as interest rates started to get higher and higher and higher all the way up to the peak. Naturally, in every cycle of the year, you can see that around fall, winter time, there are fewer homes on the market. Now, when we look at the incentive that a seller has to bring to the table to get a buyer to write an offer on a home, there are a lot of things that they can do. So as a seller, one of the incentives that you can put forth is that you'll pay towards their closing cost, a seller concession. So a portion of that purchase price can be given back to the buyer rather than a price reduction. And that can go towards their interest rate through it, either a permanent buy down, a, a semi-permanent, like a two, one buy down or any number of different things to get a better long-term price. Now this is typically advantageous to the seller because if it's say in our case on average right around $10,000 over the last two years, that $10,000 is less of a drop in the purchase price than you might see the difference in lowering the price over time to make that same home as affordable. This whole topic is a topic for a video by itself. More what I wanted to show you is the incentivization at right around, let's see, less than 50%, on average 44 to 45% after we had the huge seller's market here with you know 3% interest rates. But what that is is just slightly higher than the, the incentive rate percentage-wise, maybe not price-wise, that we were seeing pre-pandemic. Now you can see here, this is around 4,500-ish dollars on average versus now we're up in the eight to $10,000 range. That's a big difference in a seller's pocketbook, but it's an even bigger difference in the overall purchase price of the home after what we saw in 2020 and 21 with prices just ballooning to the moon. But we saw this happening. This is just data. If I can reiterate anything, this is just the information. At no point here have I said, you should buy or sell your home, right? But with this information, you can make those types of decisions based on what that means to you. Moving on to listings under contract, all those buyers that were incentivized by sellers, they become an under contract home. That means that a buyer and seller have agreed to move forward to closing to get to whatever their next season in life is. Again, this year was terrible. This was a very, very low year for number of transactions to happen, which we'll get to as well. And you can see the brown line, brown line at the bottom. We go all the way back to 2015 and we throw all these on there. So what we see here is a low transaction count. At the beginning of the year, things were somewhat looking positive. It looked like interest rates might stabilize. They didn't. It looked like uh, prices might stabilize. They didn't. And what happened was we had fewer and fewer buyers in our marketplace that were able to or willing to buy. At the end of the year, what that meant was we did see a recovery in prices, 448,000, that's higher than we started in January. 
So here in January, 426,000 to 448. That's an improvement. Median sales price went up. We are still below, yes, May of 2022, the peak of the market, which was a ridiculous climb to the top. But if you were to scratch this out and average in between, that line follows pretty symmetrically right up to where we are now. Still a little high, I think, for sure. But nowhere in here in the pricing, at least closed sales prices, do I see a crash that would symbolize idiocy in anything that I've said in the past. In fact, I didn't speculate this at all. I just said, are prices going up? I showed the graphs, just like this one. They are. What will happen here in 2024? I anticipate they're probably going to follow similar track if interest rates continue to go down. Again, this is opinion. If interest rates go down, that means that more sellers are able to sell and move because it might be more palatable, more buyers are able to purchase. That tends to create demand. But what about all the foreclosures out there? That's what you see all over the interwebs. Everybody thinks there's going to be a mass wave of foreclosures. It's all coming. The world is going to fall apart because of this gigantic backlog of foreclosures. Well, this is also data that we can look at. Part of that data is notice of trustee sale. That's when a bank says, hey, by the way, you're not making the payments. We would like that collateral back, the property being collateral. They give you a notice that they're going to foreclose on the property. It's going to vary across the country as to what that looks like. But your notice of trustee sale, your NOD, notice of default, that's a public indicator that there's a problem. It doesn't mean that the foreclosure is going to happen. From that point forward, the homeowner or the borrower has every opportunity at their disposal to fix it, whether it be through negotiating with the bank, which, by the way, we weren't doing in 2008 and 9 like we are now. A consumer can call the bank and say, hey, I need help. Back then, the bank said, screw it. We're going to take the property back. They weren't afraid of anything. Now we've had this experience. They're going to typically going to, they're going to find a way to negotiate with you. They're going to find a, a system that will put things hopefully on a better path forward. With all that being said, is there a wave coming? I don't think so. When you look at this, you can see all the way back in 2009. And mind you, I started my real estate career in 2012 with short sales, primarily with short sales. And I worked with a lot of foreclosure clients, a lot of short sale clients, and a lot of people that were just in trouble. Myself, having gone through a short sale previously, I understood it. I got it. I've been in that situation. But when you look down this graph, it goes down and down and down all the way up to the moratorium during the pandemic. See, foreclosures were shut off entirely. You couldn't foreclose as a bank. However, that ended, and you can see that they did start to pick up here, but not even to the same level as pre-pandemic 2019 levels. Life happens. People run into circumstances where either they can't get help, don't want to get help, or they don't know they can get help in getting rid of their home, or they've just made bad decisions. Sometimes it happens. Those homes, they go to foreclosure. That's a natural occurrence in real estate. And you can see that throughout the last two years, there's no wave building. These are notices of trustee sale, not actual sales. Those are even fewer than the notices. But that's just the information so that you can see the market's not crashing. Or at least it didn't crash last year when I was an idiot for saying list prices were going up even though they were going up. So there's that. Now let's talk about the Cromford Market Index. The Market Index is where these folks take all of this data, whoops, and they put it together in a way that can be digestible in a single graph. What this does is it takes supply and demand, puts them together into an index that is either positive or negative from a seller's perspective. See, 100 is pure balance. There's enough sellers, there's enough buyers, everything stays in place. When you go below 100, you start to move into a buyer's market territory, which means there are more sellers and there are fewer buyers. Typically, that's going to indicate that prices are going to come down. When you are above 100, you're moving into seller's market territory, 
which is where we've been for quite some time, and prices tend to go up. See, there are fewer home choices for buyers, and there are buyers that are trying to buy them. That creates competition. That competition is very much pointed in each different marketplace at a different rate, which is where if you have a, an area of interest, we can talk about that, that specifically, and I can look at exactly how much of a buyer's or seller's market you've got. This breaks down into 17 different markets here in the Phoenix Valley, so your market is probably there. Looking broadly at the entire market, what you can see in the last six months, we're looking at the daily chart. The market has been coming down from a very strong seller's market to a modest to very weak seller's market right here at 104. We didn't drop down into a buyer's space. There were markets in, across the valley that dropped into the buyer's area. Not terribly bad to the point where prices were just falling and going crazy and there was blood in the streets, but buyer's market nonetheless. And you can see that coming into January, we're only January 3rd, and we're already seeing an improvement here as of the first at 108.6. In my video last week, we are at 107.2, which is a one point improvement. I'd say any improvement is good. As a homeowner, I don't want my property going down in value. I do want people to be able to buy homes. In fact, my job is predicated on people buying and selling homes. However, Nobody that owns an asset, like I said previously, wants that asset to diminish in value, at least not on purpose. When we look more broadly at our market over the year, what we saw was in 2023, the pink line, we came out of a buyer's market in 2022, albeit for like two weeks, into more balance and into positive or seller's market territory. And then you can see right here, back towards that balance. This was that buyer's market in 2022, over a couple of weeks, November and December. We're past that. When we look at where we are right now, 108.9, we're still in balance. Technically as an entire market demographic, this is our balance point. But what you can see is our demand is at 69.6, about 30% low. Our supply is at 63.9, about 37% low or below what would be considered normal for our market. With these two numbers, they come up with the index. This is our speedometer, as I like to call it. So we can see, are we in the gas or are we in the brakes? With low supply and low buyers, the market is pretty tepid. Like we saw this last year, not a lot of transactions happening, not a lot of home sales transacting. So where do we go from here? There are a lot of places we go. We can go to the comments down below and you can let me know what you think of the market, why you think of the market this way, or you can hit that like button over there or the little red subscribe button and you can come back for more data later. If you didn't know, new construction is one of the best places for a buyer right now because of the deals that can be found. We're going to expand on that later in some other videos and stick back for more. If you have questions about the market, and I don't just mean the market, why do I keep hitting this mic? I mean your market. Every different area of the valley is gonna be different. Well, if they're different, they're gonna be different. You know what I mean. Statistically speaking, they're not all the same, and what's happening in your area is not gonna be what's happening in mine or somewhere else. So if you want information on that, reach out. My information's down below. Shoot me a comment, I'll make a video about it. You know what to do, it's those buttons down below. Get that done for me, it really helps. I really appreciate it. I will see you in the next one. Have a good night, day. Peace, bye. Adios. Will this be in the blooper reel? Gosh, I don't know. It's, it's still recording. I can, I can see the little light thingy going across there. All right, we'll see you.